I'm here to talk today about nannies. If I say the word nanny, I think a lot of people go uh, directly to Mary Poppins, who is the uh, current star of Mary Poppins on Broadway. Uh, because that's our normal association. There are uh, children, maybe, who need to be cared for. And we hire uh, someone else. We had this at, at my house, uh, both, both my wife and I work. So we had a nanny for some time. There are other kinds of uh, nannies. This uh, gentleman is uh, Kelly Brownwell. He's a, a food researcher at uh, Yale University. And his idea was to tax food. I see this gentleman eating a cookie in front of me. So Brownwell's idea is that this thing is bad for him. Therefore, we should raise the price uh, to try to discourage him from eating it. He proposed the so-called uh, Twinkie tax. And since this is lunch, and since Twinkies are delicious, I couldn't resist uh, revealing to you the fried uh, Twinkie, which uh, the New York Times described as something magical. Another kind of nanny, the nanny state. Here we see a new star in the New York Times. Uh, Belmont, California has banned smoking even in private residences. Uh, down here at the bottom, uh, Miss Fredrickson, 72, a smoker. They're telling you how to live and what to do, and they're doing it right here in America. <laughs> right? So this is, as she sits there and smokes on her porch, offensive to a lot of people that the government, and this talks really about whether that is important, that government part, uh, come and they tell you how you should be acting. We here in Chicago are not immune to this. The city council banned uh, Boy Gras, a great exchange between Alderman Joe Moore, who's come and spoken. Uh, he's been here at the law school. We're better as a city for taking a stance against force feeding beets so that we can make a delicious spread for crackers. Yes, and the mayor who says, look, we've got people dying on the streets, that's more important. Lots of bands. Uh, we could have a whole volume filled with many kind of laws. Seatbelts, cell phones, airbags, driving while using a cell phone, motorcycles without helmets, burning leaves or wood. All kinds of rules designed to do what? What are the purpose of these bans, or in some case, uh, taxes? Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's lots of potential justification. Children in the middle of the infirm, I think we're all fine with having someone else make decisions for them. There's another class of cases that the behavioral law and economics movement has spoken to, and that's sort of decision-making heuristics. Our sometime colleague, uh, Mr. Sinstein, has written a book about this. I uh, started with an article called Libertarian Paternalism. The idea he developed with Richard Thaler from the fruit school is that people are subject to lots of biases that make them bad decision makers. We have very uh, strange discount rates. We don't care much about things that happen in the future. So the cookie today is fine because it, I'm not really thinking about the effect the cookie's going to have five or 10 years from now on my life expectancy. People are stupid. They don't know, so we're going to ban them from engaging in certain other kinds of activities. Under this view, the Securities Exchange Commission is a nanny because they tell us, you, Henderson, you're not allowed to invest in certain types of financial products or investments. So we see a whole range of justifications for any kind of behavior that go far beyond you're under 18 or you have a uh, some kind of cognitive uh, a medically defined cognitive deficit. 
Everyone here has probably either thought to themselves or actually engaged in the uh, altruism plus control. You have a choice about giving a homeless person a dollar or a sandwich, and you think to yourself, boy, I'd really give them a sandwich because they're going to spend that dollar on something that's bad for them. The International Monetary Fund does this writ large. We give lots of money to developing countries, and then we tell them, well, this is the strings attached. This is how you have to behave, because we're afraid you're going to do bad things with it. And part of this, uh, or a lot of these things, feed, feed into the sort of cost-benefit arbitrage reason for having nannies. That is, a decider doesn't bear all the costs of their decisions. The decider could be me smoking in a bar and you breathing secondhand smoke. And when I'm choosing to smoke, I'm not considering the impacts on you, eye irritation, asthma, secondhand smoke, cancers, whatever the effect may be. Or it could be two versions of myself. The current Todd Henderson smokes because it's delicious. And the future Todd Henderson, who's going to get lung cancer, is not there. The future me isn't there to say, hey, current me, stop smoking, because you're going to be miserable when you get lung cancer. So there's me and third parties, and there's me and myself. So this is just a simple uh, story of externalities. We think that people make better decisions when they internalize the costs they impose on other people. And other people here is other people or your other self. <laughs> And nannies are largely about uh, reducing externalities, that is optimizing uh, people's decisions. And we think, on the margin, the more people bear their own costs, the better decisions, the more socially optimal decisions they will make. So the classic example, familiar to probably many or all of you, is pollution. The cost of an iPod, say, to manufacture an iPod is $100, if we consider only the uh, cost of building the factory and paying the workers and producing the, getting the raw materials and producing the iPod. But this smoke is drifting somewhere through the Adirondack Mountains, creates acid rain, destroys a lot of trees, and the farmer bears additional costs of $50 because of the pollution. If we don't force the manufacturer of the product to bear the cost of the acid rain, we'll get overproduction. We'll get too many. People will use them because the price will be set at a level that does not include the social cost of its uh, production. So what can we do? Again, this should be fairly familiar or, or intuitive. We can ban the conduct or use litigation, depending on whether the government or the farmer. So the government can ban emissions, or try to limit emissions from the smokestack, or we can give the rights to the farmer to sue. And our choice between these two things depends on our views about how good courts will be, the incentives of the parties for litigation, sort of summing the decision, er decision and error costs about uh, litigation, and in addition, the existence of collective action problems. If there's thousands of farmers, uh, and individuals in upstate New York who are affected by smokestacks from the Midwest, and it might be more efficient for the governments of those entities to act uh, together. Taxes are another way. So instead of banning something or giving people the right to sue for damages, we can impose a tax on pollution. And we see this now in the current debates about global warming and climate change. The idea here is we're polluting, we're imposing costs on the globe, Bangladesh, which will be flooded, Florida in 100 years, which will be flooded, and our kids will be living there, or I guess maybe we'll be living there. In any event, someone will be living there, uh, and so we can use taxes. Of course, there are questions about taxes. How do we set the right levels? Will they work, et cetera? And we'll come back to some of those issues. But these are the two ways. And the tax example, the, the kinds of taxes that are designed to reduce externalities are called Pigovian taxes. After an economist, Arthur Pigou, who came up and popularized this idea in the 1920s. So here we've got uh, a standard kind of supply and demand curve with price and quantity. The marginal benefit of the particular activity and its marginal private costs or supply. And the price and quantity is at the intersection of these two things. So the producer will choose quantity one and quantity two. 
but the marginal social costs may be higher than the marginal private costs. This is, think of this as the difference between the cost of building the factory and the cost of the acid rain. So how can we move the curve to account for this? Well, we impose some kind of a tax, a Pagovian tax, which tries to estimate what that social cost is. So we move the marginal private cost or the cost curve up with the consequence that we produce fewer and at a higher price. This is the private uh, efficient solution of price and quantity, and this is the socially, E2 and Q2 are the socially efficient outcome. So that's the Pagovian tax, and it's shown here by the green bar, and not other taxes. We're all familiar with Pagovian taxes. Here's a story. A uh, top house lawmaker wants to impose a fee on cars per mile driven to pay for highways. After all, the people who are using the highways, the logic goes, are the people who should be paying for it. If I walk to work, why should I pay for really, really fancy roads? Yes, if I live in a night park and drive a mile a day, why should I bear the full cost of paying for the interstate highway system, which brings people in from uh, the suburbs? There could be some objections to this kind of internalization, and many people might think of themselves as lovers of liberty and say that's a reason for opposing uh, naming kind of regulations or taxes like this. But even lovers of liberty uh, are in favor of this kind of move. Here's John Stuart Mill, wrote on liberty. He was a passionate believer in that thing. And he says, uh, quite prescriptively, the only purpose for the, which the power of the state can rightfully exercise over any member against his will is to prevent harm to others. We're preventing harm to the farmer. We're preventing harm to the recipient of the secondhand smoke. And so we can regulate their behavior. <laughs> Here's our own Richard Epstein. Right. The bottom line, the presumption of liberty can be overcome only in cases of a, a socially destructive prisoner's dilemma or a genuine externality. And uh, here's another lover of liberty with Professor Epstein uh, a decade ago. Uh, I had a lot more hair, but it's, it's you can't see it. So that hat. I just wear that hat all the time. <laughs> and that's what this paper's about. Uh, you can see here the point that we, by forcing people to bear their own costs, we can uh, uh, improve overall decision making. And this paper and this uh, lecture are about firms doing what the state is doing. And the argument, which you'll see, is that firms may be superior along many dimensions, but old story, many of you will have heard this before, the government gets in the way. Okay. An important part of my argument is that nannyism is an inevitability. It is something that cannot be avoided. We will have, if other people are paying, other people will care. You might characterize this as kind of the dark side of altruism, right? We become uh, meddlesome and uh, busybodies because we pay. But in a world where other people pay, it's inevitable. And we see this throughout the law. In corporate law, investors give their money to entrepreneurs to make products and generate more money. And those investors say, hey, wait, 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 it's my money. I'm going to control how you run your business. This can be good because it might prevent managers from stealing. It can be bad because the investors may have less information about how to design a search engine or an automobile than the entrepreneur. We see it in uh, lots of situations. And the uh, important thing is here, nannyism will increase as the amount of payment made by third parties increases. So the more we're paying for other people's stuff, the more we're going to want to control their lives. Of course, the flip side of that is, if you want people to stay out of your life, don't take anything from anybody. 
in a world in which the government uh, and firms and other third parties are increasingly providing more and more benefits and services for us, it becomes more difficult to do that. So just as a baseline, everything I'm about to say is constrained to those situations where nannyism is inevitable. For example, healthcare is probably the biggest case of this. And whether the government is paying for your health care or whether a, a firm or employer is paying for your health care, as it will be for most Americans, at least for now, at least partially, those entities are going to care about your uh, behavior. Here's a uh, story from the BBC about the UK. The UK has a single payer health care system. The government pays for health care, that is, all of us pay for all of our health care as a collective. And inevitably, the people who are skinny, who are not smokers, who lead a good life, get irritated that the people who are fat, who smoke, who lead a bad and unhealthy life, are getting the same level of care at the same level of cost. It doesn't make any sense. It just strikes us as unfair, and it's also uh, inefficient. In a recent poll, 75% of people in Great Britain said, I'm in favor of the government exerting more control over what other people put in their mouth because I'm paying for it. Every delicious filet of fish sandwich, and I think, I think this inspires me to go and celebrate after this talk to Long John Silver as it goes lots of fried fish. When this person behind that fish sandwich eats that, Somebody sitting next to them eating a salad is subsidizing that uh, consumption of uh, deliciousness. <laughs> in Taiwan, as an example, the government sends health inspectors to people's houses with clipboards to make sure they're living the kind of good life because there's an enormous cost imposed on the Taiwanese government from subsidizing people who don't. Okay, obviously, there is a problem, what I'll call the, no the knowledge problem. It's a notion that Hayek developed. How can we know what socially optimal behaviors are? What are the costs and benefits? Going back to Professor Epstein, a genuine externality. How do we know what that is? What are the externalities, the behaviors that might strike us as being offensive? Like, maybe some people are teetotalers and they view the consumption of red wine as offensive. My parents were that way. There was never any alcohol ever served anywhere near my house. My parents never had any alcohol. And they would have viewed the consumption of alcohol as an externality. Is it? Well, the medical literature today says red wine is good for you. Hard to know, right? The uh, knowledge we have is imperfect. Here's the go itself that we seldom know not to decide to what extent we should interfere with individual choice. Yes, we could do a nice supply and demand curve, but when it comes to practically implementing these things, very uh, difficult. What should the tax rate be? How do we decide what's done with the money? These are all uh, questions which we will uh, come back to. But we can probably say, as a first pass, some characteristics of good nannies. They act only when there's a legitimate externality, assuming we can figure that out. The actions are linked with real costs, not some hypothetical costs, not phantom costs, but real costs. The actions are uh, done not to impose our idiosyncratic preferences on other people. My dad telling me not to drink because he thinks people who drink are uh, self-absorbed morons. Now that wouldn't be a good reason to impose any restrictions, but uh, rather out of a uh, uh, you know, fact-based determination about where there are externalities. And in addition, a good nanny should take account of positive externalities. <laughs> if I'm sitting on the beach and someone is playing some delightful uh, Mendelssohn, they're imposing a positive externality on me. If they're playing, I don't know, T Pain, that's a negative externality. <laughs> But the individual playing the middle said, be, it would be strange for them to come after me and say, hey, I'm playing this delightful music. Can you pay me a little bit? In the same way, we would think it's strange if I went to them and said, you're playing this horrible screeching noise. Uh, I want you to stop. 
Okay, bad nannies. <laughs> bad nannies can come in two flavors. The kind of white hat story for bad, for bad nannies is they just make mistakes. Type one error, that is uh, false positives. Or type two negative, type two, that is they think there's an externality and a type one externality and there isn't. Or there's externalities that they miss. Or they simply misestimate the cost and benefits of the externality. This might be completely well-intentioned. Think of the temperance movement. The ban of alcohol that came with the Volstead Act was intended to reduce the cost of drinking on society, which are large. They just didn't get the full cost. They didn't realize that a consequence of passing this would be to encourage illicit trade in the thing, which would have even bigger social costs than uh, the existing uh, the existing laws the lab drinking. And there can also be uh, public choice stories. So a, what the, the classic example of this is the so-called bootleggers and Baptist stories. Both bootleggers and Baptists in the South were in favor of restricting all that restricted your ability to drink and buy alcohol. So Sunday closure laws, dry counties, both the religious, moral uh, uh, component of society was in favor of this because that was their strange, idiosyncratic preference. And the bootleggers, the people who sold uh, alcohol in the black market were in favor of these because they could earn higher profits. So the bootleggers would give campaign, uh, the um, uh, bootleggers would give donations to the Baptists and the politicians who follow them. Under the, uh, under the auspices of the moral, let's do the good thing for society, when it was actually about their own uh, financial interests. Another example of this is the first child labor laws in Britain. Who do you think was behind the first child labor laws in Britain, as laudable as they may be? It was the large factories who had machines that did the work. And they funded the politicians who opposed the child labor laws because they were imposing a large cost on the companies that used child labor that were their competitors. The most recent version of this, what I call cigarette vendors and constitutional defenders, uh, is the ACLU privacy. You should be able to smoke in your own house. And the cigarette companies, you should be able to smoke in your own house. Their interests combine. Okay. There are obvious uh, line drawing problems here. And it's not obvious, I think, to us at first pass where we should draw the line. Everyone would agree, drinking on the job, probably bad. Firms should be allowed to tell you no drinking on the job. But how about if you're an alcoholic at home? If there's a direct spillover to work, if I consume a fifth of uh, Goldschlager before I come and teach, then I think the dean would be upset with me and have grounds for dismissing me. But what if I consume lots of alcohol, impose lots of costs on my family, and as a result, the university's health care costs rise? Should they be able to control me going to Long John Silver's after this talk? It's a good question. I hope the answer is no, at least for now. <laughs> <laughs> Turning to firms, uh, firms have engaged in nannyism for a long time. The company town was a, a prominent example of this. Company towns were usually in remote places a molybdenum mine in Colorado, right? Building a dam in the desert in Nevada. The company would provide all of the amenities and services for the workers because you couldn't go to the local town to get stuff. There wasn't a town there but for the firm. As this quote suggests, this is about uh, Pullman, Illinois, right here in Chicago. They make Pullman train cars. Uh, men like to putter around their homes. Mr. Pullman insists on doing the puttering himself. Mr. Pullman wanted to control everything that happened in his workers' houses because Mr. Pullman was paying for their houses. <laughs> when they were drunk and listless, when they came to work, the firm had a huge cost from that. When they didn't keep their yard in good repair, the firm had a huge cost from that. When their kids were delinquents, the firm had a huge cost from that. So the firm, that is Pullman, uh, tries to control a lot of people's lives. Here's a photo of Pullman, uh, Illinois, before it 
uh, turn to a disrepair. So lots of these company towns provided lots of amenities. They were one of the most desirable places to live at the turn of the 20th century. And the story, the company town story, is pretty simple. They had to furnish these things to get a labor force. That is, there was a demand for these products to go and live in Colorado in the middle of nowhere. The more generous the firms were, the more they intruded. That is, control over behaviors was proportional to the amount of welfare the firms provided. If the firm didn't provide you a lot, the firms didn't control your life. The more they gave to you, the more they controlled you. And exit, that is labor market exit, constrained firms who went too far. Firms who were lapsed into that idiosyncratic preferences uh, bucket of bad nannies, workers fled, and those towns uh, disintegrated. And importantly, for my story about firms and the uh, government competing in this, what I call the market for paternalism, the owner of the, fir of the particular town uh, did not matter to the level of paternalism. The federal government also ran these kinds of company towns in places like uh, Grand and Cooley, Washington, and uh, uh, Grand, uh, the Hoover Dam in Las Vegas, or around Las Vegas, and they were also known for doing exactly the same uh, kind of story. <coughs> Okay, so for a long time, after the company towns fell out of favor in the 1930s, we didn't see firms acting paternalistically, but now they are again. So there's a positive account of this story, which is driven largely by healthcare. Firms are 60% of the healthcare in the United States, so 60% of people have their healthcare paid for through their employees, and there are proposals in the healthcare reform debate to mandate that all employers cover all workers. That's a way towards universal coverage. Uh, the costs are enormous, something way more than $500 billion. And for relatively large firms, 14% of total payroll costs are healthcare. This is dramatically increased from the 1960s, where it was like 1%, and way larger than other countries that provide healthcare in other ways. So firms rationally want to reduce this 14%. That's a cost that they bear for the health of their employees. So everything they can do to reduce that is their incentive to cut costs. As I said before, the most obvious way to do this is obesity and smoking. The average healthcare premium for an employee in the United States is about $8,000. And if you're a smoker, it's an extra $3,400 per year cost you're imposing on your employer. And when I say your employer, there is no such thing as your employer. Your employer is a aggregation of all the people who have an interest in that firm. The shareholders, the creditors, the suppliers, your fellow employees, everybody who's in the insurance pool with you, you're imposing on them as a smoker $3,400 a year in cost. If you're obese, $2,500. Now you might argue, well, some of these costs will be reflected in lower wages. After all, if smoking and obesity lead to absenteeism, listlessness, bad workers, you should be paid less. And that's true to some extent. The study suggests only 15% of these extra costs are captured, just meaning 85% of these numbers are the externalities that are imposed. And just to give you a sense of this, if Walmart employees smoke at the average rate of people in the United States, probably not correct. My guess is they smoke more, but that's just a guess. If they smoke the average rate in the United States, Walmart's annual cost for subsidizing their employees' smoking behavior is a billion and a half dollars. And for all companies in the Fortune 500, a hundred billion dollars in costs. Okay, so what are firms doing? As you can imagine, there's two kinds of paternalism they're using, nannyism, carrots, and sticks. Carrots, so here's some companies and some things that they're doing. IBM, if you don't smoke, here's some cash, yes? If you agree to have your family not smoke and go to the gym, here's some more cash. They're bribing their employees to be better behaved. And it's sort of voluntary. You go on an online application, you fill out a form, you say, yes, I did not smoke today. Please give me my $150. People, I think, think that this is 
Well, parents are good. You give people an incentive to join a health club. You give people incentives to walk to work or ride their bike to work. You give people time off during the day. But there's no difference between carrots and sticks. If I'm giving you $150 to not smoke, that's the same as penalizing you $150 for smoking. It just depends on what your baseline is. If the wage is $100 and I give you $150 not to smoke, or I set the wage in the reverse, it doesn't matter. Parents and sticks exactly the same. In addition, voluntary programs are a farce. They unravel. Anybody who doesn't apply signals something bad about themselves, giving everybody incentives to uh, comply, or no one's incentives to comply. And here's a quote from a benefits officer at a company that's done this. We try carrots, carrots don't work. You tell people to go to the gym, no one goes to the gym. You fire people who don't go to the gym, people go to the gym. Yes? <laughs> this should not surprise us. People respond to incentives proportional to their effect. Okay, so what are sticks? Sticks. We don't hire smokers. You take a nicotine test when you show up at the company for your application, you smoke, you don't get a job here. We give you a nicotine test, Alaska Airlines, while you're working here, if we get nicotine on your breath, I don't know how they do this, the miracles of modern science, you're fired. Yes? So when you go to light up that cigarette, you're thinking to yourself, hmm, no, I really want to work in Alaska Airlines. <laughs> <laughs> Mandatory health assessments. Firms are employing, kind of like the Taiwanese government, questionnaires. Here's one. Do you smoke, drink? What did your parents die of? Do you smoke down? <laughs> It's scary. Okay. <laughs> uh, people are fired, uh, as I mentioned. Lots of pro uh, companies have cash, uh, cost pass-through uh, programs. That is, they make you pay for the cost you're imposing. So here's Clarion Health. They measure, this stands for Body Mass Index, for those of you who don't know. They measure your BMI. When you come to work, you step on a scale. They do a BMI calculation. If your BMI is over a certain amount, you pay an additional uh, kicker for your health care premium. Each tobacco use, what your cholesterol is, blood pressure, glucose levels, pretty refined in their determinations of the cost that you may be imposing on the firm. Now to start our national charges. Employees fifty dollars a month for smoking. This is uh, pretty similar to what I described above, but you should know here that six fifty dollars a month, which is $600 per year is way less than $3,500, which I told you is the cost smokers impose on firms. What justifies that difference? Well, there could be a lot of things, and I'm sure you can come up with different ones than I have here. There could be benefits for being a smoker. Ballerinas smoke like chimneys. Why? Smoking is an appetite suppressant. And ballerinas, there's a benefit to them. This is not me making a normative judgment, but just a positive account. I assure you, for them being skinny. My judge, when I was a clerk, said that he was way more productive as a lawyer when he smoked. It's a uh, basal, uh, uh, it expands your blood vessels, increases blood flow to your brain. He was much more creative and lucid. It kept him going late at night. And for some industries, there may be a real benefit for that. You're a software engineer, you're working with an investment banker, it may be good for you to be a smoker. And firms may be able to uh, get that. Lots of other stories. Um, imposing really high costs on people's behavior may send bad signals about the firm. We're a bunch of needle nose uh, busy bodies, and that may have deleterious effects. People might not want to go to a firm that bans smoking because they think next they're going to ban jumping out of airplanes. And I really love to jump out of airplanes. Inefficient regulation will come back to you. Firms could be risk averse. There could be lots of reasons why this number doesn't equal 3,500. And we might not be troubled because the firm might be doing a calculation about setting the optimal level of uh, tax effectively. OK, so paternalism is inevitable. Theoretically, no one can be opposed to it. Nobody, no sensible, rational person can be opposed to paternalism or nanny <laughs> theoretically. But as a practical matter, how do we decide the knowledge problem, the Epstein problem, the 600 versus 3,500? How should we set these levels? That's 
what uh, this is about. And my claim is that paternalism is a product, just like everything else. People demand it rationally. If you're in a common pool, that is, you're a citizen in a jurisdiction, you're in an insurance pool, you're in a firm, you rationally want to force the people that are in the pool with you to bear their own costs. So asking why IBM or Clarion Health or Waco does what they do and impose nanny restrictions is like asking why Apple makes the iPod. Apple makes the iPod because people demand it. IBM tries to force its employees to bear their own costs because people demand it. Their shareholders, their creditors, the employees in the common pool demand that they do. And so, whenever we have a product that is demanded, we have a market to supply that product. And we've seen both the state and the firm are effectively competitors in delivering paternalism to the people who demand it. You can have the state ban smoking, you can have the firm ban smoking, both with the intent of forcing the employees within a particular firm of bearing their own uh, costs. So we should ask ourselves, who should be supplying nanny rules? Well, I don't know. I don't know who should be supplying nanny rules any more than I should know who should be should supplying iPods. The market should figure it out. The person who can make iPods or cars or bottles of water or chocolate chip cookies better should be the person making those things. So can we decide in the abstract, in general terms, whether the government or a firm should be providing paternalism? The answer is categorically no. <coughs> what we can say is there's something curious about this market that's unlike the market for iPods. The government doesn't produce iPods. And so in its regulation of iPods, the government isn't, can't be accused, perhaps, of being biased in favor of itself. The government does produce paternalism. And it also sets the rules for how paternalism is produced. You, firm, are not allowed to fire someone because they're a smoker. 19 states have rules like this. You, employer, you're not allowed to charge fat people more. The federal government has a rule like this. That means firms will be disadvantaged vis-a-vis -vis the, the uh, government in providing paternalism in ways that may not correspond at all with the efficiency of those two competitors supplying paternalism. The important thing here to remember also is that paternalism, this is not going to come as a newsflash, is going to be supplied by imperfect agents. Our elected representative, the CEO of the company, whoever it is that's making the decisions about paternalism, they're going to make mistakes. They're going to make mistakes that may be benign, misestimation of costs. They may make mistakes that are invidious. No a policy not hiring Republicans. Yes, an invidious rule. Not hiring homosexuals not allowing people to engage in speech at the work. I mean, there's all sorts of rules you can imagine that would be invidious rules because the nanism is uh, from imperfect agents. So the next uh, chunk of this is about uh, the advantages of firms in providing paternalism. I want to uh, leave some time for questions, so I'm going to skim through this pretty fast. You can see this in the article if you're interested. Most obviously, firms are constrained by markets, markets for labor, for capital, for products, for, the, for corporate control, in ways that provide discipline on overreaching. The firm says, we're not going to hire smokers. We're going to charge obese people way more than the actual cost they impose. If the firms do that, they will suffer vis-a-vis -vis their competitors in the markets for labor. No one will want to work there. <coughs> And that will drive that firm who makes a bad choice out of business. If Chicago makes the same choice, no smoking in Chicago, it could be subjected to the same kind of forces. But generally, it's a lot easier to move your employer than to move jurisdictions. Or technically, most of us have much higher investments in our jurisdiction than in our employer. It would be easy for me to leave the University of Chicago and go teach at DePaul. It would be much harder for me to sell my house, uproot my wife from her job that she loves, uproot my chip kids from the schools that they love, and move to uh, Indiana to teach at Notre Dame. So it's not to say that there is no constraint on the kinds of laws that Chicago passes, but they're going to be much lower than those that the firms would have those. In addition, employees, that is the rule setters at firms, they're subjected to high-powered incentives. 
The firm reduces its cost, you're Walmart CEO, and you can drive down that $1.5 billion of extra costs to zero. I can assure you, your personal wealth slash utility will be much higher. If the employees in the city council who vote in favor of a nanny regulation have the same effect, much less for each of them, for no other reason than there's more of them. They're also not paying based on things like performance. Elections are very clunky ways of incentivizing them. There is a uh, very important feedback loop, and this goes to the sort of high concern about uh, trial and error and the knowledge problem. If a firm imposes a no smoking ban on its employees, it will very quickly see the impact on the labor market. Imagine, if you will, a law firm comes to recruit here at the law school and says, I'm a so, big sign on the door, no smokers, we're going to put you on a scale and measure your body mass index. We're going to ask you the questionnaire about how your parents died and how you get along with your family. Okay, and then the firm next door doesn't have that. What effect do you think that would have on the firm that makes the uh, manuals? Well, there might be sorting in a good way. The non-smokers would go over here, and the smokers would go over here, and maybe the, choice, the firms can make those things based on productivity. But the point is, whether for good or bad, the firm will know immediately the impact that the rules have on its labor markets. So lots of trial and error. A broader scope. Firms can uh, ban you from smoking at all times in ways that may be more difficult for the government to do. So the government can ban smoking in restaurants. They've done that in Chicago and bars. They haven't yet said, I can't smoke anywhere. Even in Belmont, California, the woman we saw in the photograph went on our porch to smoke. We could outlaw cigarettes altogether. We've tried that with alcohol. That may be a very radical solution. But, the, but firms can be what I call narrow and deep. Only a particular firm, only this law firm, uh, is banning smoking, but it's smoking at all times because they can do nicotine uh, tests. Generally, the government can do broad but shallow. It can apply to everybody, but only in a limited number of circumstances. The way for the government to be broad and deep is taxes, but there are all sorts of problems with taxes that I don't want to go through uh, all of these. But, you know, one problem is, uh, Let's say you want to reduce obesity. What would you tax? Would you tax Twinkies? Twinkies aren't necessarily a bad thing. If I eat one Twinkie, that's not so bad, right? If I eat 100 Twinkies, that could be problematic. If I'm a marathon runner, eating Twinkies might be a good thing for me. If I'm a little kid on the south side of Chicago who's overweight, maybe not so good. In addition, there's lots of research suggesting that the taxes on food have very perverse consequences, that actually lower uh, uh, taxes on food increases the amount of fruit and vegetables that people eat, for example. We could tax weight, just like the firm was going to put you on the scale of your body mass index, but again, imagine the government doing that. When would they do it? At tax time, April 14th, you step on the scale? Like you're sure you get all on the active side for the week leading up to April 14th. Uh, in addition, taxes are much stickier. Uh, my favorite example is a tax that was put in place after the second Johnstown flood in 1936 to raise $40 million to rebuild the city at 10% tax on alcohol. Still going strong. Yes, it was a temporary tax that just did not go away. Um, and taxes disrupt the information feedback loop because they're often, the tax revenues are often diverted. The money that was earned from the, uh, the cigarette settlements was intended to be used for smoking cessation and treatment, and very little of it was. You might say, as a government, all money's fungible, so it doesn't matter, but it does matter because there's no feedback loop. If I, as the government, or the, the nanny, can't see the consequences directly of where that money's going, then I will set uh, inefficient uh, rules. There'll be greater experimentation, there's less uh, political pressure, there's a larger number of firms. States are limited to some extent by the things that they can do because of the state action doctrine. As I, I mentioned this already, right, the better monitoring. And this kind of cuts both ways. You can imagine firms are better to test BMI 
But maybe a government ban on something like trans fats would be easier if there is something that, like that which uh, a ban would justify. Less of politics involved is another reason why firms might have an advantage over setting more efficient rules. There's no strong opponent to firms, or at least yet, to firms doing this kind of individualized determination. And nanny rules, because for us, governments use taxes often, they can create very perverse consequences. So here's a great story from uh, yesterday's paper. Officials in China reportedly been told to puff their way through four and a half million, million cigarettes a year. The government in China has encouraged people to smoke because it raises revenue through taxes. So here's a perversion that if taxes become a source of revenue, and this gets to the point about the perversion of the feedback loop, the choice is not what should we set to get the socially optimal level of, ta of uh, smoking, because here it cuts the other way. So these things I'm describing could result in over deterrence uh, or under deterrence. Now, you could raise some obvious questions, and I'll just breeze with these so we can have some actual questions from you. This doesn't work, obviously, if firms are monopsonists in the labor market. If one law firm comes to the University of Chicago to hire you guys, then I'm not so happy about the market story for policing of paternalism, because they've got the whip hand. They can impose whatever rules they want. They could have a no Republican policy, and our Republican students would be, all six of them, would be out of line. <laughs> Even in the company towns, the firm, firm, I mean, I can't think of a monopsonist in, in the labor market. Even NASA is not a monopsonist with respect to astronauts. You can take your astronaut training and go work at an engineering firm, a contractor, go be a pilot, go work in the Mir space station. There's, it, it, there's an infinite number of choices, even in that kind of extreme example. And the company towns weren't even monopsonists. <laughs> Completely isolated, how many people have skills to be malevolent of minors, and yet they saw dramatic effects from uh, when they imposed too much turmoil. Firms not may, may not fully account for the social costs. That is, their estimates of the social costs may not actually be the social costs. Something like liberty interests. If an individual has very strong liberty interests, they should price that into their calculation of their reservation wage for a particular job. But each of us might have a little liberty interest that's individually small, but collectively very large. And states are very good at delivering that, firms not so much. Another problem is the government has a rule. If you're 65 in this country, you do not have private insurance. Even the CEOs of companies. Why? Because the government says, if you choose private insurance and choose to opt out of the government-funded Medicare program, you don't get your Social Security benefits. So they tax you a couple thousand dollars a month to choose private insurance. So firms, when deciding how much to impose in costs on smokers, are not taking into consideration the costs imposed after you're 65 because the insurance they're paying for doesn't cover after you're 65. So one big driver of the difference between $600 and $3,500 might be just that, a government program that bears some of the costs. You might say there'd be invidious discrimination. I mentioned this before. I think these are constrained by and large, insofar as they aren't. They can be addressed by laws, like the civil rights laws. Uh, and that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about only uh, nannyism that is uh, inevitable. Another objection, uncorrelated behaviors may cancel out. That is, I impose some negative externalities on my firm and some positive externalities on my firm. I don't charge either way, positive and negative for those things. They may cancel out. Again, that might be true. I completely uh, admit that's a possibility. The question is, which entity, firms, government, will be better at doing the trade-off and calculating when to impose uh, uh, rules designed to uh, capture the difference or the delta between those two positive and negatives? And then finally, uh, a point that um, you know, Emmanuel Kant made in his famous essay 
uh, what is enlightenment. To, to Kant, enlightenment was where you as an individual, and Professor Nussbaum is in the audience, so I'm a little bit hesitant to say that, <laughs> but you as an individual take responsibility for yourself. Where other people choose for you, he talks about cows and, and animals, domesticated animals, his fear was turning individuals into domesticated animals, creating what uh, Foucault called docile bodies, yes? So which is worse? Docile body, citizenship, or workership? Some quotes from company town experiences. Since the company was supposed to take care of house maintenance, people stop doing house maintenance. They become dependent on the thing that is acting to reduce their cost. Or even worse, the push towards egalitarianism. If we did something for Mrs. Jackson, we could almost bet our last out of dollar, Mrs. Tackleon or Scraparelli would be one of the same identical things, even though they didn't need it. Yes? Rewards dissociated from uh, benefits uh, conveyed. So both of these things are possible. Again, the question is, do markets provide a better check on uh, governments or uh, markets? OK, I want to stop in about two minutes. So the, there's a bulk of the paper which generates this talk, which is about the regulation of Nannyism. Jack Welch says to a firm who deployed some very strong nanny rules, you are a brave soul, my friend. A little less colorful than the quote itself. <laughs> to do this, you're going to be sued. And he had good reason for saying that. There are 19 states that prohibit employers from discriminating against smokers. Here's Connecticut's statute. A lot of these states, by the way, are places where tobacco is grown. See the bootleggers and Baptist story. 13 states prohibit employees from discriminating against drinkers. Illinois has a privacy law that bans employment discrimination based on use of lawful products outside the home. Why? Why should I be able to impose costs on people, huge, enormous costs, based on my private activities? No reason uh, at all. There's federal laws. Um, most importantly is HIPAA, no discrimination. You, you've seen HIPAA probably it's, it's about disclosure of medical stuff, but the bulk of it is no discrimination built on health factors and insurance. There's exceptions for a bona fide wellness program, although they don't define what that is. But the rules now clarify that they're allowed to, you're allowed as an employer to charge 20% more for someone who uh, meets certain characteristics. 20% doesn't cut the mustard, right? Just a smoker is 50% more expensive than a non-smoker. If you're a smoker and obese, you're several hundred percent more expensive. And so firms wouldn't be able to capture that uh, here. There's also a variety of other federal laws. The lawsuits in these cases, it's spaghetti. They throw all these things in with the hope of getting cut and motion to dismiss, and most of them uh, do. The cases, there's obviously cases where there's legitimate spillover, but in cases where there isn't legitimate spillover, I don't show up drunk to work, courts in a variety of states have said, there's no business purpose for you not hiring smokers, for banning people from uh, being alcoholics. Some states have specific cases uh, delineating things like high blood pressure and obesity as a handicap that is protected. So now not only are we preventing firms from stopping, as in this case from California, the bottom suggests, we're subsidizing people who engage in socially costly uh, behavior. The privacy argument is particularly ridiculous. There's a case from Massachusetts. It was an applicant. He wasn't even hired by the firm. He brought a claim suggesting that his ERISA rights were violated. ERISA protects his pension. Yes, you can't dismiss someone because they have a vested pension. And he said they were invading my privacy. He wasn't hired yet. And the court allowed the case to go to a jury on the question of whether or not they violated his rights. OK, so paternalism is a product. Firms and governments compete. There are some advantages for firms in doing this, uh, some disadvantages. Governments have some obvious advantages. One is. They have the power, they have the guns, uh, right? They have a monopoly on physical violence in the Bavarian sense. So they can increase the penalties really, really high from smoking. The Chinese famously shot people who were addicted to opium. That's an effective uh, technique. <laughs> and reduces overall enforcement and monitoring costs. 
costs. So the government can have some advantages. The world that I want to live in is where the choice between government and firm nanny is not biased by regulations that are not designed to reflect the costs of the benefits and uh, uh, disadvantages of the various participants in the market. Okay, that's all I've got. So we've got a little bit of time. Uh, I'd love to take your questions. Seeing none, I will retire along until yes. <laughs> oh. You, you sort of alluded to this when you said that the, a firm is really not going to take into some of the account a lot of the social goods. They're just going to see the private benefit to reducing smoking in their insurance fund. And it means that given all this, it, it seems like categorically, even for uh, their own pool, they're going to be undersupplying nannies. OK. so. Insofar, I think, so you're right, we, 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 it's not going to be perfect. Uh, insofar as they are undersupplying nannyism, the biggest reason I think for that is that firms don't bear the full cost of people's health care. If we got rid of the mandatory requirement to go into Medicare, or even better, got rid of Medicare altogether, then it would actually force people to internalize the cost of their well-being, and we would get closer to that kind of full internalization. Uh, in terms of other private uh, social benefits, uh, you know, something like a liberty interest, which I mentioned, then it's possible. I'm not sure I know what those are exactly, especially in a world in which we're, we're, we have to compare firm nannyism with something else. Like, compared to what? It's not the nirvana world where there's, there's no nanny, uh, there's a free lunch for everybody. So if you ask me, would I rather have the choice, I'm behind the Rawls and I want to live in a world where the government provides me with all these things, like health care, and inevitably will be a nanny, or I can live in a world where I will have a choice among a bunch of different employers, some of whom will be nannies and some of whom won't. There will be trial and error. Try I think I would prefer the latter world. I think that's the, that's the extent of my claim. Not that the firm would be perfect. Yes. Um. So the, the, your case is built on the assumption that um, we want to internalize costs because we think there's an incentive effect and people will change their behavior to reflect the full costs of their, their choices. Um, but insofar as a large factor in most healthcare is you know, genetic or externally imposed by toxins in the environment or things like that, not driven by individual choices, um, isn't that internalization of costs basically a cross subsidy to from you know genetically unhealthy people to the rest of society or, or it, maybe that's not the right way to put it but it's it, yeah, the so assumption that we want to internalize is maybe not correct universally in the case of healthcare which good. is your paramount example. Okay, so the reason we have insurance is because we believe in reducing the variability and the impact of variable claims for individuals. So I put myself in a common pool precisely because, ex ante, I don't know whether I'm going to get cancer or not. If everybody knew, if we could test people at birth, like the movie Gattaca, uh, great movie, where, uh, where whether you're going to get cancer or not, then we couldn't have common insurance because all the cancer people would be left without insurance. So you're right as far as things are uh, genetically uh, different. I think that's pretty hard to uh, make the case for something like smoking. It's possible, I guess. But there are lots of people who, uh, who quit smoking, yes? Uh, and uh, the, we don't see firms imposing extra costs on people who happen to get liver cancer. We don't, you know, we saw in the questionnaire, what did your parents die of? So we saw a little bit of that. Uh, and that's probably not a good thing, maybe, along with the point you're making. And so I would expect, as the market works its way through, we won't see firms doing that. And if they are, then we can imagine laws designed to prevent that. If we think it's socially optimal not to impose uh, genetic variation costs on individuals, then we can legislate to that effect. But that's not what we've done so far, and certainly firms most of the firms that are doing this are focused on things like overeating and smoking, which are at least much less likely to be attributable to something like genetic variation. Even if they are, the inevitability point uh, still stands, right? The UK, the government, is 
doing this too. And my claim would be that if the federal government in the United States starts paying for everyone's health care, we can be assured that they will start acting a little bit more nannyistic. Yes? Well, the question about having like, good externalities from smoking, we might not be taking into account. But don't we, aren't those easier to take into account? Like your former boss, when he was a private lawyer, if he was doing better law work, he was being paid more. So if you're a ballerina and you stay skinny and you're a good ballerina, you're going to get paid more to be a ballerina. Yes. So aren't those already built into that person's wages, whereas the negative externalities, because they go on to everyone, I mean, your boss hurting someone's health care costs might be, I mean, it's less obvious to um, have to. So it just seems to me like the good positive externalities are already in this wage. And so what does that mean? It just would, one of your things, I guess one of the points was that we might not want to, maybe we do want to go the whole way, I guess what I'm saying, because you say that good externalities might come back, but it seems like we already paid. Well, I guess all I'm saying is that firms will be well positioned to make assessments about what they should be charging for. If it turns out that smoking has benefits, then they probably won't penalize smokers. Yes? And they'll let smokers who get paid more keep those wages as opposed to taxing other wages. A, 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 a government who looks across the jurisdiction and says, should we ban smoking or not, is going to see some firms where smoking is a positive, some firms where smoking is a negative, and impose a tax for the average, and it doesn't take into consideration the heterogeneity of externalities. So the narrowness of firm rules could possibly capture some positive externalities if you could tell those stories. I don't know. What do I know about whether or not people are more efficient? I've got two anecdotes for you. And what I'm just saying is no individual could possibly know, and having localized decision is more likely to lead us in a market process where losers are weeded out to the optimal outcome. Yeah. So I was really surprised at your answer to the question before. I thought I thought that you were gonna say, um, you know, if we if we can figure out that there are gonna be people with you know genetic problems or whatever that uh, the market should take that into account as well. I mean, where do you, and the reason that I'm surprised is because it seems like at some point there might be lots of things that are genetically controlled that we can figure out in the future or whatever, and, and how, do you, how do you figure that out from the government perspective as opposed to at the marketplace? Well, insofar as there are things that we can identify down the line where you have a genetic defect that will impose costs and where we have the technology to fix that thing, then I'd be fine with firms charging for it because we should fix it, yes? So if we identify a gene that says this will make you fat, that's a bad thing, probably. And we can make a judgment as a society about whether or not we're going to be transparent about that. And if it is, then we should let firms charge because there may be situations where, you know, being fat is a good thing. I don't know, fat people are it's Santa Claus, jolly. They, you know, they make, they make good designer babies, and you know, that's just a whole world I don't want to get into, because I think we can make those kinds of collective choices. The criticism of our collective choices now are laws like the 19 states that say, you can't, as a firm, charge smokers more. That seems like a very crude, bootleggers and Baptists, you know, Connecticut that grows tobacco leaves, yes? Horrible. We end up in a situation like China where we're paying people to smoke. Or so, in, so in the situation where someone has some kind of genetic defect they have no control over and we have no control to fix, then you're all right with subsidizing those people in that situation. That, that, that I think is the question. Well, I mean, I'd have to see the individual cases. You know, I've interviewed here at the law school. We, you, know, you screen for all kinds of behaviors that you don't necessarily advertise that you screen for. Yeah, I mean, I think at the government. Level. Yeah. Okay. okay. I think we're